I've changed, and so I, and I saying, don't have any skeleton in my closet. You're saying from that you're a hundred percent saint now. I'm not saying that I'm a saint, but I don't do those things. In the early 1990s, Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson began his ministry as a student of Roy Masters, a British-born talk radio personality and hypnotist. Peterson and Masters promoted a similar system of meditation and theology, a system that includes rejecting the Holy Trinity and our Blessed Lord's divinity. You blame things that you do, uh, but thanks to the feckless and spiritually absent bishops, Jesse's theological errors didn't keep him from gaining tens of thousands of Catholic and patriotic followers. Jesse's draw for conservatives was his commentary against the Marxist group Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, um, radical um, so-called social justice warriors, they were chanting, what do we want? Dead cops, when do we want it now? Pins in the blanket, fry them like bacon. And people went out and started killing cops and everything. Back up! Back up! Exploiting many angry American men's desires for a stable family life, Jesse would directly call out feminists for their role in destroying the family as well. Sexism is a made up lie, and it's been made up by women who hate men, who hate the family, who hate the unborn child. The 73 year old even visited the church militant studio in March when senior executive producer Michael Voris answered his questions about Catholicism. Did Jesus just rise from the dead in spirit, but that's or did his body come out also? He was, maybe his body came out, I don't know, but I know. Well, that's a big rose, deal. <laughs> he rose in the spirit. That's what no, he rose in the body. Why, why I want to make that? So but he rose clear. in the body. You can't say he didn't walk out of the, t walk out of the tomb on well, Sunday. And from what we knew at the time, Jesse was an ardent opponent of homosexuality in and outside the church and presented himself as such. The spirit of homosexuality is of their father, the devil. It's not them, the person. It's the spirit that made a home in them. And it came from them overreacting to some sort of a situation in life, whether it's from someone uh, uh, messing with them when they were kids, or overreacted to an angry mother because you become like what you hate. But shortly after the March interview, friends of his came to us with a different story. These stories first came to light when Jesse's former co-host and alleged decade-long gay lover exposed him. 61-year-old Patrick Rooney has known Jesse for nearly 30 years, dating back to roughly 1992. Everybody know Patrick Rooney, one of the smartest white men on this side of heaven. The two were so close that Jesse was the minister at his wedding and the pastor at his baptism, long before Rooney claimed any homosexual activities began. Right around that time, I also had started a, a TV show. I was doing a public access TV show in LA and uh, with a friend of mine who uh, had uh, gotten off heroin and, w and wanted to, he asked me to be involved in the show to help uh, other people get off drugs and things like that. So we started a show and one of our first guests was Jesse and another gentleman from Bond. So we did a couple shows with them. And from that time forward, right after the show happened, Jesse and, uh, and I talked in the green room, you know, backstage. And right off the bat, he started asking me stuff. Jesse's very forward with his questioning and things like that. So he actually asked me right after that show, uh, are you gay? Rooney's characterization shows that Jesse allegedly used similar grooming tactics as other homo predators, like Saginaw priest Father Robert DeLand, who asked similar questions when preying on a young man in 2017. To discover that you have some gay tendencies is a fine thing, mm. because then you don't have to be so confused. Right. Do you feel less confused? Mm. Do you? Yeah. After Jesse discovered Rooney's same-sex attraction, his relationship with Jesse was taken to the next level. Bit by bit, Jesse began edging him closer and closer to sin. Once, we, once he moved up there to do the show, we stayed in the same house. Jesse would kind of do some things, kind of horseplay and stuff like that with me. 
and at times he would uh, do stuff where he would like grab me and then we'd kind of wrestle around a little bit and I'd feel his you know private parts against me and he did that more than once so it wasn't like an accidental thing he would kind of do it and then I even mentioned it like you know what's that or whatever and he would kind of play around and joke about it Fast forward to 2005, and Jesse was ready to make his final move. We did a uh, conference with them called Moral Reconstruction, which is kind of ironic uh, now that we're sitting here talking about something, something else. It's called Moral Reconstruction. We did that. That first conference was, I believe, in 2005, and uh, we did a follow-up conference in 2006 with them as well. And I went with Jesse to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, for this conference. Uh, I was a fundraiser at the time. And so we did fundraising, and I was, I was part of the conference. While we were at the conference, um, we stayed in uh, Virginia, you know, near, near D.C. So uh, we were sitting on the bed together, and um, all of a sudden he turned to me, just looked, me, looked at me, and he said, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And he said it in a, in a tone that was really insistent. And I'd never seen his tone for him before. It was like kind of scary. It kind of scared me. Like, like what? What do you want to do? I knew what he meant. And then I told him, well, okay. And at first I'm scared and I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm playing along here. It kind of threw me off my game, I guess, in a way. I think later I realized that's kind of something that people do sometimes. It's, it's like the devil works in a certain way by intimidating you. And it throws you off your normal game. And so he said, what do you want to do? And he's like, okay, I'm scared. And then... Uh, I said, I told him what I want to do. I, I mentioned sex acts, you know, that, we, that he knew about that I had already talked to him about that I was interested in. And next thing you know, he's ripping his clothes off and coming at me, basically. And I did the same, took my clothes off. And next thing you know, we're, we're fully at it, having, not, not getting into detail here, but basically full on uh, sexual acts. Rooney's recollections show that Jesse mirrored Delan's sexual advances almost identically. I love you. Love you too. I know. What are we gonna do? I don't know. No, what are we gonna do, really? Rooney's description shows that after their sexual encounter, Jesse began intertwining his private homosexualism with blasphemy. After we had just done our the first sexual act, and then ever since then, he told me that once we did this, I was born again. This, I, this sounds crazy, but this is the absolute truth. He said that I was born again. He would remind me of that through the years. Following being born again, Rooney contends that his sodomitic relationship with Peterson went on for roughly 10 years until Rooney decided to come clean to his wife and son. My son was really angry. My son was mostly angry at me because he had Jesse on such a pedestal. He, he, my son had Jesse on such a pedestal, he literally thought Jesse could walk on water. We got on a phone call, we talked to Jesse, and as soon as we brought it up with, with, a, with my son on the phone call, Jesse denied it. And I said, Jesse, you're a liar. You're lying. You know, this, you know you're lying. And he finally came out and admitted to my son that he, he, he did that. Rooney later moved to Florida to get away from Jesse. But according to Rooney, Jesse couldn't handle the relationship ending offering him several bribes to get him back to L.A. It's typical for homo predators to try and cover their tracks using a cornucopia of strategies to shut people up. In the case of Father DeLand, it was now deceased Saginaw Bishop Joseph Sistone, who remained silent on DeLand's abuse for years. While serving as an auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia in 1994, Sistone allegedly watched as documents containing names of up to 64 suspected sex abusers were shredded, earning him the nickname Bishop Shredder among the U.S. bishops. According to Rooney, for Jesse and those loyal to him, the strategy was to bully and silence all victims and witnesses speaking up. Jesse did throw me under the bus, basically, and other people that, that did anything like that, and still does. If anybody comes up with it, they'll they'll keep anybody off the You're air. You're talking about other victims? Well, uh, yeah, other victims. Uh, and he'll make sure that if anybody talks about these things, calls up his show or does anything like that, they were not going to get through on his show. Patrick explained how easy it was for Jesse to discredit victims, given Bond's history of seeking out troubled young men. A lot of the people that Jesse brings around him are troubled young men, right? <clears throat> Have drug problems, right? Some of them been in jail. So it's pretty easy to discredit a guy who's been on drugs, maybe in jail or something like that. It's pretty, pretty rotten thing to do. 
beginning last November, Rooney began writing a collection of blog posts hinting at Jesse's predation, leading him to a shocking discovery. After I published these articles, I found out from a young man, a very credible young man, that Jesse was fooling around with this young man. That young man was 30-year-old Samuel Arambula, a more recent member of Bond and Jesse's latest known purported victim. I started going to Bond around May 2020. 2020. Uh, this was during the coronavirus lockdowns, everything. As soon as they opened back, they were doing um, live uh, broadcasted, uh, no in-person church for like oh, two months or two weeks or something like that. But as soon as it opened up, I went. That was May 2020. Um, the Jesse, what he likes to do in the church is he goes around first timers. He goes around first timers and says, introduce yourself. What's your name? You know, how'd you find us? Where are you here? Um, the first thing I said, I said, my name is Samuel and uh, I'm here because, uh, you know, you helped me a lot. Uh, I, I went and forgave my mom. I went and forgave my dad. I had a lot of anger and I just dropped that. And I feel way better now. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm really, you know, growing and I want to thank you for it. Among him are three other alleged witnesses and victims who also chose to tell their stories. Samuel began his relationship with Jesse professionally, washing cars for him and doing other cleaning work at what they call the Bond House. The Bond House is where Jesse and several of his male staff currently live. And when Samuel began opening up to Jesse about his past, things got personal. I was molested as a boy, so I was like, Jesse, what do I do? Like, this is uh, weighing heavy on me. What should I do? He said, forgive him, it's in the past. Our relationship progressed slowly, closer and closer. I didn't suspect anything weird of it. There were certain times where he began hugging me where I was like, oh, I've never been hugged by a man. Like, what was this? But I was like, this is, I get, he would just tell me like, you know, I just love you. So I'm like, okay, I, I get you, you know, I love you too. But much like with Patrick Rooney, Samuel states things went from casually close to mortally sinful. So a Friday afternoon, uh, evening, I go to Jesse's house and I am sitting in his couch, relaxing, you know, I'm, I'm kind of avoiding the LA traffic at the peak hour. So it's a good, it's a good deal, and I get to stay somewhere with someone that I respect, friend. So then, by this point, we're already real comfortable with like hugging and and all that stuff, you know, just hugging for long periods of time. I thought nothing weird of it. I guess it, my my guard had already been let down completely. So he, I'm sitting on this couch. He kneels down in front of me, and then he wraps himself around his arms around my waist, and I'm like, okay, this is kind of weird, but. Uh, I'm like, Jesse, why are you doing that? He's like, I, I just love you so much. And I'm like, okay, I guess. I was just like this. So then he starts rubbing my thighs. And I'm like, okay, what is he doing? Like, it's kind of crazy. And then he starts rubbing my uh, genital area. And I'm like, uh, what's happening right now? And then he, uh, and then he pulls down my pants. And then I'm like, I'm shocked. I'm not saying anything. I'm like, my face is like, whoa, what the hell is happening right now? From there, Jesse instructed Samuel to go into his so-called meditation called the silent prayer. And he's like, doubt all thoughts. All thoughts are lies. Everything Satan is telling you is a lie. And I'm like, okay. But inside is telling me, hey, you, this is not good. Um, what, are, what are you doing? Uh, what are you allowing him to do? Samuel describes Jesse abusing the supposed meditative state trying to convince Samuel to ignore the traumatic sexual experience occurring. It went on for a few minutes. He would uh, get up, walk away. I could hear him. I couldn't see him. Get up. He would get up, walk away. I could hear him get up, walk away, touch it, get up, walk away, touch it. And I was like, what the hell's going on? So then I opened my eyes and then I'm like, uh, what, the, what just happened? Another alleged victim was Trayvon Chapman who in 2015 told his friend, now 43-year-old Armand Martikian, that Jesse molested him. Well, the first thing came out of his mouth, uh, that Jesse's homosexual. And I say, you know, he can't be saying this, you know, like he's all against it. He's a, you know, straight conservative man who, you know, this is like, what you're saying is bizarre, you know, it doesn't make sense. But at the same time, it kind of struck me as a truth. What this guy was saying, he was explaining the incidents, like certain acts that they would do. 
they had some nickname jesse had nicknames for it, you know uh say instead of telling what the act is he say named it oral massage according to trayvon armand tried to tell jesse what trayvon said and he just dismissed it i went to jesse i said jesse i bumped into trayvon and he was talking bad things about you the moment i said that his first response was oh he's on drugs when he said he's on drugs Shivers went down my spine, like, uh-oh, aren't you going to ask what he said about me? Trayvon has since disappeared. None of the men have any idea of his current whereabouts, though they assume he's still somewhere in L.A. After this encounter, Armand began questioning his own relationship with Jesse. And then I had a flashback. Back in the day, it was such an insignificant thing that it never stayed in my memory, but for some reason, the flashback had when I was in the private counseling, uh, he kind of gestured me, let me see down there. Uh, pointing at my, referring to my, you know, down there as in my privates. Not knowing what, what it was about, I'm at late, very late teens at that moment, you know, like kind of got tricked into it, pull my pants forward where he kind of look at it. But at the same time, I'm thinking like, maybe he's trying to see if I'm shy. He's trying to help me overcome shyness because I was a little shy, you know. I didn't know what to make of it. I remember saying, if somebody sees us from outside, they're going to think we're gay, I said. Later, I looked back, thought that the fact that I said if somebody sees us, they're going to think we're gay. He kind of probably thought that, uh, okay, he's too aware. I'm not going to advance any longer. Former Bond House manager, 50-year-old Robert Santner, alleges he witnessed similarly strange behavior in 2021 between Jesse and current Bond producer James Hake. What I witnessed him, him and Jesse, were hugging and hugging each other intensely, uh, rubbing up, rubbing each other's shoulder down stuff. And he came to a point where I actually saw him kissing him on the cheek, kissing him on the cheek and stuff on the hallway, and talking all kinds. I can't remember what the words he said, but there were a lot of giggling, a lot of giggling in the hallway, in his James room. And then there was even one time that just really shocked the living hell out of me. As I went to the laundry room and stuff, I mean, after I checked, the, took the laundry out, and then when I got out, and there was a door open in Jesse's room, and um, there I saw Jesse was sitting in the bed, and while James Haig was <clears throat> wrapped around bed sheets, completely around like a burrito with his head sticking out, and Jesse was like embracing him and hugging him and stuff and then kissing him on the forehead. And I was like, uh, hey, are you, are you all right? Hake, to this day, is an ardent defender of Jesse and his ministry, essentially helping him ostracize all the men accusing Jesse of homo predation. Santner also described an incident where Jesse attempted grooming him to see if he was a homosexual. Like there was one night, okay, I was all by myself. It was like late at night after I came home from work. I was in the kitchen, you know, take, doing my own thing and stuff. And then suddenly there was Jesse appeared on the doorway, leaning against the doorway with his hand underneath his underpants. And he was like slowly massaging himself and was giving me a look. And I, and I turned around and says, what the heck are you doing? And he was like giving me a smile and giggle and stuff, and then walked away. Another witness is Martin Francis, who's largely been leading the charge against Jesse's purported homo predation. He describes himself as one of Jesse's best friends. You may recognize Francis from a video with Jesse arguing with a Univision reporter at a Prop 187 rally in Los Angeles in 1996, a rally opposing the flood of illegal aliens entering the state. Are you all right? Are you okay? Oh, I, I'm feeling better than ever. Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Are you racist? Am I what? What, what, are you, what are you think of these people now? Why? Why are you stay you here? Said, are you racist? Am I racist? Yeah. No, I'm not a racist. Why do you ask that? But since learning of Jesse's dark secret, Francis has led several protests against Peterson's homosexuality outside of the Bond studio. Jesse was confronted by him several times this year and refused to address any of the accusations of him preying on young men at Bond. Here's a video of Francis from March, facing off with him at what appears to be the post office across the street from the Bond studio. Oh, that's nice. 
He wants me to tell them how I was sleeping with my brother's wife. That's fine. But Jesse, why will you not speak on your homosexual behaviors? Francis confronted him again in the back of the building with Armand Martikian in February, capturing it all on video. Jesse Peterson, I've known you for 25 years personally. Will you come? See, he's not coming over to me. Will you at least stand there where you feel safe and talk to me? Stand up on your porch with the door open and, and, and shout out to me. Why won't you talk to me? I've known you for 25 years. I've accused you of heinous things and you will not talk to me. You coward. Francis admits there were also a few clues that should have revealed Jesse was a homosexual long before he ever found out. He wanted to see if I was willing to have a homosexual relationship with him, of course, because that's what he was all about. He was about putting out feelers there and seeing who he could have sex with. And it didn't work with me because I'd not been molested as a boy. And so eventually I told him, look, Jesse, I'm just an angry guy and I don't like these long hugs and, and all this stuff we're doing, you know, at night. And did uh, he stop? Uh, where he would come into my bed and just lay with me. You know? He would come into your bed and just lay with you? Yes. And at one time even like put his hand underneath my underwear to go toward my genitals, right? He never got there because I, he could see I wasn't getting excited. So he never got there. He just like at the edge, you know, because you got to invite the vampire in is, is what they say in the vampire movies. And it's sort of true with even psychic vampires like Jesse. And so he was, um, he would do those kind of tricks or, or uh, put his hand around my back and uh, up on my chest and be hugging and all that kind of stuff just to see if maybe I could get, uh, and asking me if, uh, uh, how does it feel? And it feels good, right? And all that kind of stuff. And I would meekly answer, yeah, it feels good. But uh, only because when you're under that kind of uh, pressure, you just give the answer that he wants, but you're really like wanting to get the heck out of there. You're like ready to fly out of there like a bat out of hell. Jesse appears to have used every dirty trick in the book to silence him, allegedly trying to have Francis arrested for violating an unserved restraining order. I will go back to Phoenix and chill out with the relatives like I was doing before, and I'll be back on the 25th. Okay. 25th, yeah. for you, this is in the sealed envelope today, if it had it been? Yes. Yes. If it was already served, you had already seen this, you would be one to go. Church Militant asked every single victim and witness if they thought Jesse would continue sexually preying on men. And they all had the same answer. Well, yeah. I would say yes. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt that there's current victims. I think for sure. Jesse allegedly accuses these men of harassment, but some members of his own congregation disagree, like former Bond House tenant Fabian Asensio. The harassing is just an excuse for, um, you know, trying to shut people down. Bond has been a nonprofit church for all these years. He's lied and collected a lot of money from that church, from people saying that, you know, he's been a hidden homosexual. There's, a, there's plenty of evidence for it. There's no reason for us to make up anything. So for someone to be out there in the alley and talking and trying to wake up the employees and say, hey, what are you doing? Why are you still working for this liar? That's totally within our First Amendment rights. Jim Valerio, longtime donor and friend of Jesse's, also pushed back at his defenders. And for those of you people who are still supporting this so-called fraudulent, hypocritical, uh, serial, predator, homosexual, you are going to pay a price for that. That is a stain on your soul when you meet your creator. Period. Cut. This isn't even the first incident. Jesse was embroiled in a homosexual scandal in October 2020, after his Twitter account liked a gay pornography image. After the tweet was left up for hours, Jesse's account was immediately locked down and set to private. One caller on his daily JLP show broadcast tried asking him about it, and Peterson hung up on him. Did you lock your Twitter account because you got caught liking a gay OnlyFans post? Amazing! Do you think I had my own Twitter stuff? Oh, somebody else was did it? How come you locked the account? None of your business. What the, what the? Are you a homosexual or something? 
No, but it doesn't really why matter. Are no a, why are you such a, a beta male? What, you know all that stuff that's going on. It's not real. But you're being a girl right now. What making you be a girl right now? There's nothing wrong with it, Jesse. I There's mean, nothing wrong were, with you being were, a girl? They were, they were in. Goodbye. On top of those we spoke to, there were several other anonymous alleged victims Church Militant was made aware of who refused to speak with us per their devotion to Peterson and his so-called ministry. Jesse continues to deny his own actions to his congregants and his fans, shutting down any victims who stand in his way. For Church Militant Special Assignment, I'm Joseph Enders, Detroit.